Welcome, everybody, to the September meeting of the Library Marketing Book Club. Thank you so much for joining. We really appreciate it, and we are super excited. Uh, we read this month, we read Smart Brevity, uh, and we are so excited to have one of the authors here, Roy Schwartz. Um, and Roy, I grabbed a bio. I forgot to ask your assistant for a bio, so I grabbed a quick bio oh, off the internet. You. Let's see how accurate it is. Roy is co-founder and president of Axios, the, at this time, new media company. Uh, this was in 2018. Um, he launched with Jim Van High and Mike Allen. Roy is a co-founder, president of Axios. Um, Axios means worthy in Greek, uses elegant efficiency and smart brevity to deliver top insights and reporting on business, tech, media trends, and politics to smart, engaged readers. Roy is the former chief revenue officer for Politico, the digital media company that upended and forever changed pol political and policy journalism in Washington, New York, and Europe. Roy was featured in the 2015 Folio 100 as a corporate catalyst and by the Washington Business Journal in 2015, 40 under 40. As an expert in digital media, business, and strategy, Roy is a frequent speaker at conferences like South by Southwest, Min Minfolio, Digital East, Interactive Media Con Conference. Roy was a partner at Gallup's management consulting practice in Washington, D.C., and California, advising on Fortune 500 companies on employee and customer engagement. So thank you so much, Roy. We're so happy to have you here. And uh, if you just like to just in, take a moment to say hey to everybody and anything that you would like to say to start off. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you for the uh, the flattering intro. I think 40 under 40 was a very long time ago, um, but <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. Um, you know, we've been really excited about Smart Brevity and just how successful it's been. It's sold about 100,000 copies so far um, and sells uh, between one and 2,000 copies a week. So uh, oh what's interesting is it's spreading really quickly and uh, our theory as to how it's spreading is that a manager or a leader reads the book and then buys it for their team, and then they buy it for their team, and it spreads uh, within an organization. And I think now, given remote work, uh, people are uh, having to write more efficiently, write more often, try and fill in the gaps that are no longer being filled in in terms of uh, the office. And so uh, they're looking for ways to do that. We're never really taught how to write efficiently or effectively in school. It's kind of interesting. I have an undergraduate in business. I have a graduate degree in business. And nowhere in any of my education did they teach me how to write an email, not even once, <laughs> right? Uh, I know how to do PowerPoint. I know how to do uh, you know Excel spreadsheets. I can read financials. But I do email all day long. I feel like all I do is email. Mm -hmm. um, and yet they don't teach you how to write effective email how to even think about effective uh, communication. And so Smart Brevity was our book that basically said, look, we've learned a lot about this from news media. People are gonna have to become more efficient in how they communicate. They're gonna have to actually think a little bit more about how they organize their content because unfortunately, uh, we're all getting inundated as it is and it's only gonna get worse. Like, like uh, I can tell you guys that because of um, you know LLMs and uh, generative AI, this election cycle, you are going to see thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces of content that were generated by computer and are able to be sent out all at once. Um, whereas you know the last time we went through this, they were human generated and it was still overwhelming. Now they're going to be computer generated, uh, and so um, you know we are all going to be overwhelmed with information and content. And so writing effectively, writing efficiently, um, and being able to break through is going to be really important. And that's, that's what the book's all about. Yeah. Thanks. Right. That's wonderful. And yeah, it definitely, um, yes, big, uh, part, even since the book is more of an explosion of AI, um, at least consumers using AI. And we all, I know we all talk about it here. We often use, um, AI to assist, um, you know, like chat JPT AI yeah. to exist. I mean, we've all probably been using lots of AI over the years, but, uh, now it's really, right in the forefront. So um, let me just go to the audience real quick and see. Um, I just like to first do this. Let me go out and see um, who has a comment or, um, you know, what did you think of the book? Who had something that they'd like to share uh, with, with us and with Roy about Smart Brevity? 
and you can just unmute yourself, raise your hand, whatever works. Hey, Alicia. Well, one, I wanted to say this has been on my reading list for a long time. So I'm so glad that this popped up even before I knew that, Mr. Schwartz, you were going to be on it. So thank you so much. Totally loved it. Loved how even when I was starting to read it, I realized, I think they're writing this in the way that we should write. The bullet points and very short <laughs> um, to do all of that. And I do have some questions, but I just wanted to say, have loved reading this book, have and I'm not even I'm not completely finished with it, but I'm already starting to think and how I communicate with um, the people that I work with and other even just in personal life, just quick information, how to get that out uh, for all of that. So I will have questions, but I'm going to get off and say thank you. I am enjoying this book and I'm so glad I finally have an opportunity to start reading through it. And I will be recommending this book. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, Alicia, you're welcome. If you have a question to jump in, but if anybody else has anything, please shoot up your hands. But uh, otherwise, Alicia, you if you got a question, you can take it now. I don't know if this is part of a question and it is an observation sure. that went through my mind. So if anybody else has experienced this or Mr. Schwartz, as you've been, you're getting feedback is I found that, and I kept coming from this at a woman and working on a staff with women. Whereas when I worked with men before this book even came out, I learned to short a lot of things and to put an email, I could be more straightforward. But as I um, am working with more women, I found I had to couch things a lot more that that being very straight to the point um, was... Aggressive. Yeah. Aggressive. Yeah. Yes. And I didn't know if any other women, as you were reading this, were kind of going, oh, well, this, will this really work for me or will I be seen as aggressive again? Alicia, thank you so much. Um, that was the exact same thought that I had as a woman in marketing and communications. I work with mostly women now and I get the feedback all the time that I need to not be so direct. <laughs> that my, um, when I am to the point and concise and direct, it is viewed as abrasive or too uh, assertive. Um, actually, the word, I think the word aggressive is used instead of assertive. And I, and I feel like if I were a man, it would not come across like that. And so... But I am I have really enjoyed reading the book as well. And I every I, I agree with every single point in here. I just don't think I can actually put this into practice and still uh, operate in my environment. Yeah. So um, the the thing that I think would differ um, and, and I'd be curious if, if you try this and, and see if it works is I think that the um, beginning of a, a piece of communication, that is very dependent on the relationship that you have. And so, you know, in the book, even even Jim and I didn't agree on this point. So so Jim and, and you know, was saying this point, like, <laughs> you know, skip all the pleasantries and just like, you know, jump right into um, the, the, the work part of it. Um, on that part, I think it's very culture dependent. In, in your case, you're saying it's very uh, dependent on who you're working with and, and, the, and the sex of who you're working with. But but I wonder if it's, um, th that could be extended. Like if you're dealing with a lot of really warm people with strong relationships, an email that's as abrupt uh, and sort of straight to the point is gonna seem very cold, right? And so I think you still have the front of that communication be the way that you want it to be or be the way that you might need it to be warm, um, acknowledging people's birthdays and, you know, last time you saw them and whatever it may be. However, the structure of what's underneath it, the fact that it is um, put into a hierarchy, the fact that it has white space, the fact that some things are bolded, I think those things would come across as um, good for both sides. And, and in many ways, um, we sell a software around this called Axios HQ. And one of the things we tell people when they're first starting to use HQ is to actually tell the reader, hey, we're going to be trying something new. 
something that should make communication more streamlined, more easy. So you're going to see more white space, more bullet pointing, some bolding. Um, we're going to think a lot about the content that we share. They put that into the first few notes, like, hey, as a reminder, we're experimenting with this. But if in your case, I would leave the intro, really warm pleasantries as, as is, I would add that part that, hey, we're experimenting with a, um, a, a way of communicating given how busy we all are and how many emails we all get. And I think you will get the response that you want, which is how thoughtful right? Because ultimately smart brevity is about being thoughtful. It's about putting the reader first and you're saying, Hey, I know you're busy. So I'm going to get right to the point. Um, but because it's reader first, if your reader wants you to be pleasant and wants you to have the pleasantries and wants you to like, I always, for example, lead all of my emails with, I hope you're doing well, you know, in the book, it says, don't do that. I always, <laughs> do it because that's my personality. If I met you on the street, I would, that's how I would talk. Right. Um, and Jim's not like that. Jim's much more to the point, right? He's a more he's sort of aggressive uh, speaker in that way. Um, so you should be yourself, right? You should be, if you're fun, if you're uh, warm, if you exchange pleasantries, you should do that. Don't take away from that. It's more that you're sending that note for a reason. That reason, don't don't bury that, right? Don't Don't hide that. And think about the hierarchy. Think about the white space. Think about all the other rules in the piece that goes underneath it. I think you'll find that people will come back and go, oh, I really like this style. Yeah. Thanks, right. Tammy, you have a question. Yeah, I I never realized it was a male-female thing. <laughs> um, I am always using bullet points because I don't want anybody to miss anything in my text. But recently, one of my kids who's a marketer said I'm too blunt. So I do tend to go in back into messages and add humanity and personalization in there. Um, and the book says that also to make sure things still are, are human. So that was good. Um, it's a good reminder. But I have a question about how do you, um, how, how brief can you be? And when you're faced with online uh, time on page or SEO requirements, you know, blog posts yes. should be 300 words or more, but yeah. I don't have that much to say. So what is yeah. your thought on that? Uh, so first I'll say, like, if anyone who reads Axios uh, AM, which is our morning newsletter, knows that that Mike Allen, who's the author of the book, but also the author of that um, daily newsletter, is really warm, right? Like, he's he's very personable and talks about his family and all of that. So, so there is room uh, for that. You're right that in SEO you can run um, against some of those things in a negative way if you're too short. So depending, if you're if you're out there and you're trying to do marketing and you're creating a content landing page and you want, you know, SEO, then yes, you're kind of like, you know, you, you, you definitely are going to have to have 300 or so words on a page, right? Um, in order, in order to communicate that. Um, I think if you've, um, given enough thought to what you're trying to convey, you can make those 300 words as impactful as possible. And so you can make each one count. Um, but to your point, you may you may just need to go longer than you might otherwise want um, for those reasons, which are, you know, right now at least unique to the way Google, um, you know, scans for, uh, for uh, pages and so forth. That's going to change, by the way, with, with generative AI. Like, all of that, everything we know about SEO is all about to change. Um, so, you know, I don't know if it happens in the next five years, the next three years, but it's it's not going to stay the same. Good. I hope so. Thank you. <laughs> That's excellent. Thanks, Tammy. Thanks. Great questions. Great, great discussion. Uh, Mary, you have a, Mary, you have a point. Hi. Question. Well, I love the book. I haven't finished it either, but I'm going to buy it. I, I got it from the library, but I'm going to buy it. <laughs> I, I want to refer to it many times. I was thinking about, well, one thing I wanted to say is before I came to the library, I worked in automotive and it was talk about male dominated. I mean, you know, and we did a whole thing on male versus female communication. And it was all about get to the point bullet points. If you don't say what you're going to, what you want the person to do in the first sentence they won't respond. I mean, you don't, they're not, you know, 
I mean, and it's, it, it works. I mean, it's like amazing. So what I, what I, how I take that, especially in the library world where we're all lovey dovey kind of, um, compared to automotive anyway, <laughs> it's in the subject line. So I always really try to think about what I'm putting in the subject line. If I want somebody to do something, mm -hmm. I really, because a lot of times if you're forwarding a message, you're using the old subject line and that may have nothing to do with what you want the person to do. So I really focus on that in an email situation. And then the other part is when we're communicating with our customers or our patrons in our e-news and things like that, you really have to be brief and to the point and, you know, think about them, not you, but, and then the whole communicate like you're talking to them. I am talking to you it's not we or they, you know, kind of being more personal and um, and really get to the point. So this was just, and it took me back to my journalism days. It, yeah. This should be in every journalism class <laughs> in the world. It was great. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Uh, no, everything you said may, may, makes a lot of sense, right? Um, you're you're dealing with clients, um, you know, the, their patrons on your end, you know, in my world, their clients. And I'm interrupting their lives, right? You know, I'm sending them something. They they don't they didn't know I was going to send them a note today. They may not even want my note today. So I know that I have to be to the point, but nice, but I have to be to the point and share with them either something that's important to them or something that's important to me that I'm asking uh, from them. And so so that's a great way to do it. The other trick that we have that's in the book is read it out loud, right? If you're you know when you read something out loud, um, you use different language. Like I like to use the the example of a forementioned, right? People will write that, but they never <laughs> say it, right? And so, you, you know, when you read it out loud, you start to remove the words that uh, people tend to type, but don't tend to say that distance you from the reader. And so that that's the other trick uh, that I found. No, oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, Forementioned is not one that we typically use in spoken conversation. <laughs> Maybe in a script or something, but uh, but not really. Hey, Chris, you got a question? I do uh, enjoyed the book. Uh, did it in a very brief way of listening to it on one point five speed. It was <laughs> it was wonderful. Well, I would do uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> but I um I had a question. You know. Email is is a, a good way to use these strategies, but some kind of in the workplace communication tools that have been taking over a lot are like Slack and Google Chat. And how do you bring these techniques into a place where people really like to regurg regurgitate a lot of information that maybe we don't need? Look, uh, in many ways, Google and and, and Slack and and Teams. Um, the the entire medium is short right and 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 it is conversational so the nice part is it removes the formality it's usually very to the point um and so it i think i think it can be very effective right in terms of smart brevity however the downfall i think of slack and teams and uh you know um the the google version is uh it's it's really hard because people, anyone can jump in with a conversation and the audience is so big that you start to lose like the, the train of thought, right? Like you'll be talking about something and then three people are talking about like lunch or something like it, like it, it gets, it veers off course. Um, one thing that we've found that we do is even though our um, work is completely Slack dominated, we send once a week uh, emails from each department that share what they're doing, what they're working on that week. And we send it to the entire, um, to everyone on the executive team and everyone in their department. So we sort of summarize the most important things that that group is working on. Um, you could find them in Slack, but it would be very hard uh, to, to, to peel that out. And it would be a lot of work on the part of the reader to go in and try and find that stuff. Um, but I think anything that you try on Slack in smart brevity should work kind of the way it works on social media because the medium itself is short and to the point um you know those things do still tend tend to work i would say yes but 
when you send an email or a one-way communication, you are only being nice to the person receiving it. But mm -hmm. if you get into a two-way communication medium, then it's like, how do you discontinue the conversation? So it's not, so it's not like, actually, I would have preferred a 12-page email to this two-day conversation. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that is a tough one. Um, yeah, I think you show them how like, hey, I think this would be more efficient in an, in an email or, or hey, can we um, move it to a separate channel, right? That's one thing that I've done is just move the conversation to a different channel. Um, Absolutely. But that, yeah, it's hard. I know what you're talking about. Some people love it. So they just go back and forth all day long. And it's like, oh my God, I do not have time for this. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Roy. I think we might have time for one more question. Does anybody have a question? And I do if nobody does. Oh, Alicia, hit it. Um, just over all of this and feedback from people that you talk to and try this, what are some pitfalls people have fallen into that you go, oh, try and avoid this? Um. Well, I think it depends on the application. So, so we work with 600 companies that have rolled this out. Um, and if they, tr if they um, aren't consistent, right? So one thing I would say is we believe very much in a consistent communication from the company to employees. Even if there's not much to say, send it at the same time and uh, every week. So when I'm working, you know, we work with some really big companies, but when we're working, you know, with, with a Delta airlines or a JPMC and they're communicating to their employees, we say, you know, whatever day you've picked, let's say it's Monday at 8 AM, every Monday at 8 AM, you send a note. Sometimes that note has five things. Sometimes that note has one thing. Sometimes that note has nothing, right? Like if it's right before Thanksgiving, it's like, Hey, have a great Thanksgiving. We really appreciate everything that you're doing. There's no additional updates today, but you've sent it every week. And the reason that that's important is if something were to happen, they're going to look for that note to include that, that important piece, right? And you're setting a cadence where your, your expectation is that they open it up. So now you have the opportunity to have important information conveyed on a regular basis. Our clients that had this during COVID say that it saved their company because they already had in place a weekly cadence each day. They already had a high open rate. And so when they were talking about COVID, they didn't have to establish a new system or a new protocol. It was like, hey, we're going to talk about it every Monday at 8 a.m. or whatever day they send their thing. And like, that was it. That's where it was. Uh, and they were able to communicate it. So sticking to a rate, if, it, if it's a company, and maybe even if it's within your environment, sending something on a consistent basis so that people know, oh, okay, I get this every Monday at five or whatever it may be. Um, I would say that that's one that, that, is, that is important. I'm trying to think of other pitfalls. I haven't really heard of many other than when you first started, it takes longer to do. People expect yeah. it to take less. I, I equate it to like a gym membership, right? <laughs> it's going to the gym. If you go to the gym a lot, you will end up looking better. But if you get a gym membership and you only go a few times uh, and then you quit, nothing's going to happen, right? Smart brevity is like that, right? When you first start, it takes longer. It does get better over time. You're able to do, but because you're organizing it, because you're giving it a hierarchy, because you're planning it in your mind, of course, it takes longer than just sitting in front of a screen and, and typing. And so stick with it. And at the other end of it, you're going to become a much more efficient communicator. Um, well, I have to jump, but this was Thank a pleasure. You, Thank you guys so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you for being supporters of the book. We're really excited. And uh, if you have other questions, um, you know, feel free to email me. Thank you so much, Roy. Really appreciate your time and, uh, and have a great day. And we'll look forward to talking to you again. Thanks. All right. Take care. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Uh, we will continue talking about the book um, for anybody who uh, is still on. Thank you so much for coming, though. I just want to say that again. It's great to have a nice full screen of uh, people on Zoom. So awesome. But um, but wow, what'd you think? How was that with Roy? Pretty good. Pretty good. 
pretty good. So I was very much initially thrown off by the conversation. I hadn't thought at all when I was reading about it, about differentiation between writing within different sexes. And yeah. this threw me back into like a uh, undergraduate class that I took where we talked about the laugh of Medusa by Helen Sisu and her idea oh. of écriture féminine, which is like the style of feminine writing. And now I was like, well, does that have any applications for management and business writing? And anyway, that <laughs> lost me for the, the whole rest of that conversation. So I apologize for that. I did read the book. Yeah, but... yeah, yeah. What did you think, Victoria? <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was good. I think what I struggled most with um, mm. was the potential for losing nuance. I feel like in my library community, you know, anytime I remove some of that fine print from something where we say, oh, you know, this is specifically for um, pre-walking infants or, you know, like this one service is just for this specific use only. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and a lot of those rules and regulations, if I if I leave that out or if I de-emphasize that to the point where people might not see it, then that gets called out for me as something that I need to return emphasis to, even though that might mean none of it gets read. <laughs> Yeah, that I think, yeah. That's such a good point. Uh, go ahead, Leslie. I have the ex exact same problem, Victoria. Uh, when I try to post something short and quippy on social media, ultimately people fill up, you know, with questions about, well, where where do I find out more information? And it's like, seriously? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we yeah get I feel that like for too, me, it's yeah. the staff. It's difficult to mm. get that staff buy-in, especially um, for losing some of that nuance. I don't feel like it's something where I work where there's any sort of resistance to bullet points or, you know, that more um, direct style of communication. But I do feel like, at least not externally in our external communications, but I do mm. feel like there's um, a tendency to be verbose just because we have so many rules and regulations to communicate to people all the time. Yeah. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense with the yeah, with the nuance and with the the um the fine details. Um, you know, I I mean, has anybody started using this so far? Alicia, go ahead. Oh, Alicia, go ahead. Well, this was something to put out because I've noticed in in the world in which I work in, a lot of feedback has been sometimes you have a lot of people on an email conversation. And then is it do you send a lot of small emails that have the title of what you want to talk about, because a lot of people save, they will save emails and do that. And I have found, I would rather have multiple that is exactly what you're going to talk about. So if I have to go back and find it, I know this conversation is about this policy. This conversation is about this marketing program, instead of things being, you're talking about multiple things in one. And I didn't ask that question to address, is it better to have short about one one topic or two um, that people can refer back to? Maybe it is, it's your one-time newsletter or monthly. I mean, we don't, our, our director doesn't communicate like that, but you know, <laughs> it's go back and see this, this program, this marketing, whatever. Because it is, it's a back and forth. Even when I was teaching, it was people don't read. Yeah. And no matter how many times you do it, they'll go, I didn't get that. And they're like, mm. you yeah. know, so I don't know if it's a battle, the same thing as I didn't know the library did that. That will forever be the sentence <laughs> that we all hear. I didn't know the library did that. Okay. Um, but I don't know. Does anybody else do that? I mean, I prefer that now of just smaller things straight to the point. Yeah, I like, yeah, I like that kind of thing too, where, yeah, where you just have, I mean, I like that idea of, yeah, not trying to get too many. I, I often do that where I try and get too many different things in an email I'm like, oh, and this, oh, and that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it easily becomes confusing as to what you're trying to get across. Um, so is that what you're talking about, Alicia, is like, yeah, trying to put too much in one message that um, that everybody and kind of the heading um, doesn't match. So when you go back to try and find it, you're like, yeah, where was that? I don't know if anybody else they come across that a lot. Is I'm finding more and more that heading needs to match. Yeah, and when it doesn't, it's like I hope I can find it again. I have a fairly exhaustive like 
labeling system in my Gmail right now that's <laughs> wide spanning. And I realized today I have like three labels that only have one thing in them. And that's really annoying to me. <laughs> and please keep the conversation under the email. Reply to the email with yeah. the whole yeah. conversation. <laughs> that is very frustrating, Carrie. When, yeah, when the whole conversation is one thread and then somebody starts the same conversation in a different thread. It's like, oh my God, we could have found the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, and like Chris was saying, yeah, it's that's what Gmail. Gmail is is a new search engine for us now. And yeah, being able you want to be able to find those headings and those titles. So I think that is, you know, something that that could be useful. The one that I use most often in those kind of things, I don't think it really talks to this, but I use like the what do I want people to do with the email? And this, I don't know if this is what someone else was talking about, maybe Mary, but like, you know, if I want people to take action, like if there's something they need to do with the message and with the information, I try and always start this subject with action required. Or if it's, you know, um, I, I mean, I guess I use all those kind of things, please read, which are all the same, but, um, but yeah, but then again, that doesn't really help with the topic itself. So yeah. So keeping the topic on Victoria. I found, I, I keep, I run one committee here <laughs> and <laughs> the, the only change that I really made to things was every time I have like an action uh, in any of our meeting minutes, I have a color code. So every single person in our committee has a different color assigned to them. Uh -huh. And if there's an action item for them, I list their name in that color. So they know that that is an action item they need to monitor so that it makes it a little bit easier and, Hopefully it's not super colorblind accessible, unfortunately, at this point, yeah. but, <laughs> um, but I I've, hadn't even thought about trying to apply some of those things in other communications too, but I could see it coming in handy in email. Yeah. Yeah. Alicia, go ahead. Um, also, one thing I work with with our libraries is getting them to start doing newsletters because mm. again, that trend in libraries is to do more newsletters that are worthy. And I with, um, I can't remember who it was, the state of Georgia, novelist, mm -hmm. and went yeah. through their, I don't know if anybody else went through their marketing online, which was really good. But as I was reading some of this and going, you know, your heading should be no more than six words and, and, and then trying to convey to some of our writers of, you need to get it smaller. And even to some of my partners, because I'm, I was not raised up in library world. I'm coming from outside of library world and just trying to get that brevity while trying to come across the warmth of the library and its community. And it, it seems to be a push and pull of, we don't want to look oh, one over marketed, uh, you know, mm -hmm. too streamlined and slick and flashy but also with the research they were showing is people don't spend time reading, you know, these big long paragraphs are going down and it's how to get this message to um, my other libraries because I'm not writing it. I have to influence and teach them mm. how to do that. I don't know. Is anybody else in that situation or it's this push and push? Pull in this world um, that I guess they don't they don't feel they have to compete um, to mm. get heard quite so much. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think it does make sense to me. I mean, I think I see some other I saw some other heads nodding with uh, with trying to get people to do some different things and and um, um, yeah, people don't like to read long, long blobs of text. That's very, that's very clear in the book, and uh, and very clear in a lot of things that we hear. Um, and yeah, it is difficult. I mean, you know, I have people on my staff that um, when they started, uh, kind of in the same vein of the book, um, wrote a lot. Um, <laughs> wrote, you know, they were very verbose. Now there wasn't bad writing; it was fine writing, but it was a lot, a lot, a lot of writing and. And, um, you know, and we really tried hard doing some different things to get down to just the the core. And I wish I had had this book um, to share with them at that time, but some of the other books um, had been helpful in that. Anna, you have your mic open. I didn't know if you had wanted to say something or. Um... Um, I, oh. I was just leaving it. Um, uh, I realized. Oh, I typing. Okay. Um, 
but I was thinking, didn't didn't this come up in, and I was just trying to remember, this came up in another book that we read, because um, I was thinking, we have all these blog posts, we have librarians who write blog posts, mm -hmm. and they're so long and dense. And I think it came up in, in another book where it was suggesting this kind of like same thinking, like bullet points. People will read bullet points, they will understand them, they will absorb the information. And I feel like that's a really like, I would love to apply smart brevity to those blog posts, but I'm not writing them. Um, <laughs> the librarians are. And um, and it's a tough sell. It really is. Um, and it's I think it's just it's been that way for a long time. And it's hard to. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I this book really makes me want to work on that, but I'm mm -hmm. not sure quite how. You can buy them that. all a copy of the book, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yes. I mean, That's I feel like in, yeah. in an e-news, you just want to get people's attention so they're interested and click to get more information. You don't have to tell them everything. It's like, here's a little quip. And if you're interested, you'll click and have like a little box, more information. Or, you know, you don't have to have this much copy in your new I mean that's the way I look at it and nobody reads anything anyway so if you don't get their attention you're out of luck anyway so I don't know I just I look I I just look at it very and I'm not a librarian I have only worked here for five years so and I do all the writing and anybody sends me something I edit it I take out yeah. all the exclamation points <laughs> exclamation points drive me out of my mind and everybody uses them. Every librarian at the end of every sentence is an exclamation point. I want to scream. So I take them all out. I just edit them and I don't care if they don't like it. Tough. Because <laughs> I'm the only one doing it. So <laughs> no, that's Mary, very good. Though. I do. I'm terrible. What Mary, are you going to do? do? You think do you think that's harder for people to do? And maybe Anna, do you think that's harder for people to do? Because like he said, this will take longer when you have to really think think yeah and how do you edit it for what the other person's reading um that that's a hard thing and maybe in library world people were busy I would put it as we're library busy but that's coming from outside of the library world um that that's a hurdle because it does take more thought to be shorter Yes, it takes more it's time. Helpful. That's what he said. Once yeah. you start thinking go, about honey. it yeah. that way, though, yeah. you once you're really thinking about what is the main point, when you, I know it does take a while to go through this process, but once you start thinking like that, it's so much more helpful in your communications, just about everything, just gets so much clearer. It really is. Carrie, was that your, was that your, what you were saying, or did you have another? No, I was going yeah, so, to point. Mm -hmm. piggyback on what Mary was saying Please. about the, the sort of clickbaity um, captions. <laughs> so I, when I first read this in January, I went into it like, like, man, I hate these guys. They've, <laughs> they've, they've made all this, these clickbait political articles. And I'm like, okay, I got, we, I have to read this because it's, and figure out how, we can use this for ourselves in you know a less clickbaity way but this is this is the trend this is this is what's happening and we need we need to learn how to to go with it yeah. <laughs> instead yeah. of against it and and i ended up i i don't think that their intentions were malicious and I really like the process. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It can seem that way because yeah, I was going to pull that up. Tammy, you had, uh, it, but no, Carrie, I, I thought the same way. I mean, like even when I heard about, but I've heard so much about Axios, like people finding stories in there. There's a, um, our guest in November is on a podcast, Robert Rose. He's on this podcast called this old marketing and Axios is like one of their sources. They're always bringing up like this. Uh, here's an article from Axios. I was like, well, it's got to be something special. So, um, Tammy, you had Tammy, you had a yeah, a couple things. So, I and mean, sometimes the headline versus clickbait. I find it hard to come up with clever headlines. I mean, you know, or make things shorter. Um, mm -hmm. But then again, sometimes I feel like our we already have a captive audience, and our people are going to read our stuff. Sometimes, even if it's terrible headline, you know, <laughs> title. So I don't know. But about Anna was mentioning the blog posts, mm -hmm. I think might be a good idea. So what about just summarizing? 
at the very beginning and inserting a paragraph at the beginning with bullet points. These are what you're going to read about next. And then if people click, you know, continue reading, then they continue reading and you can see the time on the page that people spend. But if you get the, if you summarize and get the essentials at the beginning, then you've got your brevity and the librarians have all their words and everybody's happy. And, and the public can choose what they want to read. They want to read the executive summary or do they want to read, you know, the whole document. Or yeah. like a journal article abstract at the top. Yeah, yeah nice. just like summarize it all. This is the, this is essentially what you're going to get out of this article. Here are the top three points or, you know, three a couple of bullets, maybe a, a pertinent link and read on for all the details. Because I know they mentioned in the book, um, here's some links for further reading. I forgot what they mm -hmm. called it. Um, like go deeper, you mean? Go deeper, right. Yep. But like we always have like read more or for yeah. more information or, you know, but the same thing, you could have, have summarized the article in the beginning. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, it's like smart brevitying the front and then, and then you kind of keep on rolling. I think that's a, yeah. I mean, and I, I, I don't know if that helps, but I think that, it, I think that's a pretty neat idea to uh, maybe there's a chance where you can add some of that to yeah, the Yeah, No one gets mad if you edited that you edited their text. That's right. If you didn't yeah, edit, you just made there. it brief. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds great. Like a great middle ground, yeah. not actually taking away what the work that they've done, but just making it easier to absorb. Yeah. And sharing, like letting them know, you know, if you're not online, you don't know what too long don't didn't read means, you know, yes. TLDR. Like, <laughs> so somebody who's not online and doesn't know what that means, you, you could tell them about it and say, this is what the public wants. The public right. expects a summary. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah. That's a great point. And it'll help. Yeah. Alicia. I was just going to say, Tammy, you reminded me, I actually do get um, an article. It comes every week and I click on the things and they do that. They will do the top point and I'll read through. And that does make me decide I want to read deeper or I go, no, I've got enough. Actually, that I'm going to remember that and give that to my newsletter people because that is that is a good in between and to go deeper. Has anybody looked at the, because I hadn't before, has anybody looked at the Axios website to see how they are doing this? So here we go. Some of you said maybe you had, but um, so this is what it looks like. It's, it's, you know, it's, you know, more than six words. Um, so we could have uh, wrapped them on that, but you know, it's got the headline and Lisa, you said the image is all, and you're right. Uh, the image is all in, uh, in everything that uh, that makes it but then there's the headline there's the image there's your first sentence there's your why it matters and there's your go deeper and every single article and i was like oh you know that's neat at the one at the top every article they have same thing their image sentence why it matters and go deeper so they they do stick to uh to what they do and that's how they they make an awful lot of money <laughs> doing this so um, so I thought that was interesting if anybody hadn't uh, taken a look at how they're putting it into action. Um, and uh, uh, Alicia, yeah. I'm sorry. No, that's great. Oh, Please. Let's and talk. I wanted to ask, because I know they mentioned that in an email, like even trying that format in an email. Yeah. Has anybody tried that? Why this matters to do anything like that? Or did it just feel weird and awkward? Anybody has? Yeah. I'm looking for one now that has it. No, I mean, I think that's, I mean, in a, at least we're in my library, we're not that big. And if you really, I mean, we can just call, talk to people. I mean, it's, it, you know, there, where I worked before was a huge multinational, huge, huge company. And if you really needed to, I mean, that makes more sense where you have a much more complicated work structure. I think the library is, I mean, we're, we don't even have a hundred employees. So, and three locations. So for us, it really, it, uh, to me, it, the, the communication isn't that complicated. Um, I, don't know I have done it. Feels, but. Yeah. I mean, I've done it. I'll show you um, if anybody 
Let's just see. So we had this. Um, so I've been doing it in emails um, inside and I've been doing it in emails in Savannah. Also, we use Savannah for email marketing. So I've been using that. I've been doing it also. Um, but we had this, this was an assignment that we had people were actually coming up with, um, every department is coming up with what's your battle cry for this celebration that we're doing. So I started off with my little exclamation point. Hi, all Mary. So you'll love that. Um, oh, and I used another one here. Um, but you know, just the sentence about, um, without everybody working together, 10% increase in distinct card holders wouldn't have happened. Everybody should be happy. And then why it matters. And then I used a quote from Neil Gaiman, which maybe was verbose. Um, but then I talked about like why it was important that people participated in this process. Um, and I, I've, I've gotten fine responses from it. Um, I've also been using it in some of our communications to customers about, um, about different things. Um, that uh oh i don't know maybe you never even saw it because i don't know if the share worked um didn't work okay well here let's share let me try one more time here okay so there's my there's my headline action required what's your team's battle cry um hi all uh without everyone in the library working together so there's the opening sentence of what what's the importance why does this matter why does it matter that you do this so you know here's the little quote which i thought was still relevant because we're trying to get people to uh, work together plus librarians um and just a couple sentences about um what people are you know what what's the importance of why we're celebrating and why we did this all together and then broke it up into your assignment, battle cry guidelines, um, what teams are participating. So, and I normally don't write things. I mean, I've written some in the past like this, but definitely not the why it matters. And I'm actually, um, so one thing uh, that when you're all talking about why it matters that I've had a hard time is I'm trying to use this in some formats where we're delivering bad news. Um, and why it matters is a harder thing when you're delivering bad news, in my opinion. So, for example, we are telling people that um, we're telling. Uh, so we had this. I try not to go into too much detail, but we had a card that was called a gold card. People that were longtime um, employees of the library, 20 years or more, that then retired would get this we'd get the gold card. It wasn't actually like a gold card. It was, it was a, a benefit um, that they would have. And um, it would pretty much give them benefits for even if they moved out of the County and they also had longer um, borrowing periods and things like that. So we had to tell people, um, you know, Hey, we're taking away this card. And if you're out of County after this time, you're not going to, it's not going to work anymore. Um, so, you know, telling people, hi, the gold card is going to be, you know, is going to change to a regular adult card after October 1st. And then, you know, saying why it mattered just felt weird. It was, um, it wasn't the right transition. So I think for that one, I either used the big picture or, um, bottom line. I think I used bottom line for that one. Cause the bottom line is that it costs money, um, for us to administer different things. And, um, you know, so anyway, but I've found looking at some of those other axioms has been helpful. So, but uh, yeah, what anybody else tried this or um, anybody else giving it a go, Victoria, or did you have a point? Yeah, I tried it just earlier this week um, with, I had like a big block of text that came in for a youthy newsletter that's supposed to go out on Thursday. Um, and they did a great job doing some of the things that I've been asking them to do, like talking with getting quotes from some of our staff members um, to get like actually a little bit more than just promoting ourselves all the time, um, get a little more human interest in there. <laughs> and so they did that, but then it ended up being like really long paragraphs. So um, I went in and I tried to boil it down to they were talking about school age programming and early childhood programming for the fall. Um, and so it wound up that they had kind of one paragraph about early childhood, one paragraph about school age programming. I boiled it down to basically three bullet points for each. The last bullet point was a quote from the librarian um, about nice. early childhood. The last paragraph, or the last bullet point was a quote from the librarian about school age programming in that one. So that boiled it down. I showed it with them to the, the librarian who sent it to me. And I was like, hey, is this okay? She was like, yeah, that's fine. Um, so <laughs> I feel like in, in approaching some of these conversations about trying to make things, it seems like there's a lot of tensions around trying to keep things brief with staff, which I can understand too. Um, 
I feel like coming at it sort of from the angle sometimes that the librarians approach things of like in collection development, you know, they can't keep everything all the time. They understand that. Um, that they have to weed parts of their collection, that they have to make sure that they're maintaining a healthy collection and um, having something on hand that people will use um, and that will be up-to-date information. So, yeah. No, it's a good point. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So it's a great way to do some editing, to get something, to get it much clearer. Yeah, absolutely, Victoria. I mean, I think 